Hello, 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 world. Happy, happy Thursday, April 13th. We are finally live uh, for those who are anticipating this wonderful conversation that I'm about to have um, with wonderful award-winning author, friend, and previous client, Susan Lynch. Um, we had some technical difficulty this morning because we learned the hard way that this event was somehow scheduled for 11 p.m. tonight. <laughs> and it is in fact not 11 p.m tonight it is right now although we are now 20 minutes late so we're either late or we're early we're not really sure either way we hope that you get a lot out of today's conversation susan's joining me because in the month of april i'm focusing on the idea that our stories serve us and serve others and i'm bringing to the table and to the conversation people that i've worked with that have had tremendous stories that they've wanted to tell and to share their experience in writing them. So without further ado, I'm welcoming Susan Lynch to the conversation. Susan, tell the world everything about Wonderful Fabulous You. Oh, thank you. Um, so my name is Susan Lynch. I am a mother. I'm the mother of two adult sons and I'm a dog trainer. Um, I have spent the past 25 years training and competing with my golden retrievers in dog shows and also been volunteering with them as certified therapy dogs. Um, in 2015, my son, Kevin, my youngest son, died of an accidental overdose. So my book, um, I'm a published author. So my book is called Life After Kevin, A Mother's Search for Peace and the Golden Retrievers That Led the Way. Um, it is the story of the loss of Kevin to an overdose and um, moving through my grief with the support of two amazing dogs. Um, it is a story of loss and grief, but it's also a story about hope and connection. Um, it has three major themes of the book, which are um, the stigma of overdose and how that impacts our grief, um, signs from our loved ones and staying connected to them. And it also highlights um, what my dogs taught me about living and grieving well. Uh, everyone, Susan's book is gorgeous, and you should go and grab yourself a copy. So I, I didn't put in the whole title because the banner was going to be like this big. And we didn't read it. Um, but grab Susan's book, Life After Kevin. Uh, you can find it on Amazon. Um, it's gorgeous. I'm going to hold it up so everybody can see. Um, it's an absolutely beautiful book. And as, uh, as I mentioned in this banner, um, Susan did win an award. Uh, for Life After Kevin, uh, which is considered a memoir. So um, Susan, uh, what I would love to hear from you is as you were writing Life After Kevin, so it's it's draft stage, you know, you're working on the manuscript, the book is not out yet, we don't have this, you know, beautiful, full uh, physical thing yet. How was just the writing of the book a service to you? I was actually really excited to write it because I had been not talking about it for so long. So it felt really good to be writing the story um, about what happened to me. But also, I feel like um, it was really healing to be able to balance the story out by sharing some of the some of the funny moments of Kevin and talking about his life. Um, I think that especially with overdose, we hear about that in, in numbers and as statistics. And I, I really wanted to humanize it. So it felt really good to be able to, to do that and to give the reader a glimpse of who he was as a person and not just how he died. And did you find that like, I mean, cause by the time that you started working on the book, it had been a number of years um since kevin's passing did you find that like there were new new layers of healing that you tapped into oh you know, absolutely. As you were drafting? Absolutely. absolutely yeah it was uh it was very cathartic to be able to you know it took me a long time to be able to tell people how he died i kept that um a secret because of the stigma and the shame i was going through so um 
it was like once I finally decided to tell my family and friends, I was like, okay, if I'm going to talk about it, I'm really going to talk about it. And so there was an element of um, excitement that I guess kind of had to explain to be able to potentially make an impact um, with, with his story and my story. So let's talk about that then for a second. So, I mean, I mean, I remember this, but nobody else will know this. When you, when you came to me to start working on Life After Kevin, um, you had a, a pretty distinct, I thought, you know, kind of vision or hope of what Life After Kevin would do for readers, you know, for other people who were engaging with the story. Um, can you share a little bit about like, you know, obviously you said destigmatizing, right? Um, overdose, but you know, what were some of the other things that you were really hoping that this book was going to do for the people who were going to pick it up on the other side? Well, in the beginning, I, I really didn't have the scope of what it could potentially do in the beginning. I thought, okay, well, it's going to, you know, memorialize Kevin, um, to, you know, for me and for my family. Um, so that was, you know, that was one of my goals. And then also, um, I felt that it was a great story, um, a human canine connection story about how my dogs helped me. So I was really deep in the dog community. So that was really, um, initially, where, what I thought my audience, who I thought my audience would be. And then as I started writing it, we got, I got about halfway through the manuscript and I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> this is going to be way bigger than that. So, um, yeah, so that's how it was in the beginning. And then, you know, by the, by the time we were done, um, you know, with the manuscript, I was like, okay, this, this has the potential to really, um, help other people, you know, other than overdose and, you know, cause grief is a universal um, experience, you know? So um, I was hoping that it would be able to touch readers in a way to make them feel less alone. Yeah. Yeah. I w so I want to touch on a couple of things for those people who are catching this, catching this conversation. Um, the first is that Susan just mentioned something that's really, really critical to writing a good, a good, great, compelling memoir that's impactful, and that's the universal piece of it, right? So as Susan just touched on, Life After Kevin is about grief and healing, and that is universal to the human experience, right? We will all experience some sort of grief or loss in our lifetime, regardless of the circumstances around that grief or loss, we will all experience those feelings. Um, and the nuances and complications that come come with that. And a memoir is meant to tap into the human experience so that the reader can, can connect with the author, maybe not through the individual situations or circumstantial pieces, but by, by the heart of what's being talked about. So in Susan's book's case, right, like grief and, and healing and loss. Um, the second thing that Susan mentioned, right, um, is that originally she thought Originally, she thought that the book was going to be about like how our canine companionship can be really useful to our healing. And that was kind of like one of the main tenets of the book. And I think Susan and I would both agree that that's still definitely a pillar of what this book is about. But but as she as she mentioned, all of a sudden it was like it was like this and it went and like <laughs> the manuscript like blossomed into this much bigger thing than what Susan originally came came in with. And so I wanted to point that out too, that, that, that writing a book, especially one that's about your life experience, has a way of evolving. And you think when you enter in that it's about one thing and it's gonna do one, one thing for others, it's gonna do one thing for yourself. And ultimately, as you go along the way, you recognize how much more there is that it can do for yourself and, and for others. Um, so Susan, you, you've been like, you've been crushing it, my friend, since this book came out <laughs> in October, 2022. Um, so we're what, six months, six months into this, like being out in the world, October, November, March, April, maybe more like seven. Yeah. Seven. Yeah. yeah. 
Um, so, okay, what have you been up to with Life After Kevin since it actually became published? And like, are you learning like new things that the, that the book is actually capable of that you hadn't foreseen? Yeah, so <clears throat> I, I never really, like I said, grief is a universal experience. And what I thought would be that people who have been touched by overdose would relate to the book and, you know, with all of the um, challenges that it, you face with an overdose. But what I didn't expect was people that had different experiences, you know, maybe the loss of a parent or um, from some other cause, you know, could have been illness, anything. So that was really surprising and exciting because, you know, it had the book was able to relate to a lot bigger audience. Um, so now I am going out. I have a presentation, um, like a PowerPoint presentation that I've gone around to different groups, um, libraries, clubs, organizations, and I talk about healing after loss. And the book ends up being a really nice jumping off point. Um, because like I said, there's, there's three themes with the book, um, and I incorporate them all into the presentation. And I also give, um, takeaways, you know, about what, because the book, as much as it is about grief, it's also about my healing process, um, which is always ongoing. You know, you don't ever get to a point where you're healed. Um, it's always, it's, it's a way of being in the world. So me being here with you, me being here, you know, going out and giving these presentations is a way that I continue my healing. And so I talked to the group about, um, I'll say, you know, there are practical and spiritual ways that we can actively participate. And there are things that we can do to participate in our own healing. And I think one of the messages that I want to give people is that we are capable of that. And it's very empowering because grief is like, it is not empowering. We There's so much out of our control. So I think that letting people know that gives them hope and that healing is possible. And that's a big message that I have, that yeah. there are things we can do. And isn't that, I mean, that alone, I feel like, is is helpful right to know that there are some things that we we have in our control you yes. know because there are so few things after the loss that feel like they're in our control you know we couldn't keep the person here or we couldn't save them or we couldn't right. just stop you know what happened we can't go back in time yet we can control how we respond right or what types of things we decide to try for healing or what kind of support we allow or those types of things. But I think that we need somebody sometimes to tell us, like, right. there are a few things that you can do. One of the first things um, in the, well, in the beginning of my presentation, um, I have a slide and it says, um, I was wondering in the beginning of my grief, I was asking people, is my life just going to be something to endure? Right. And that's how it felt. Like, I, I didn't know the answer to that. And the mm -hmm. book ends up being this, you know, kind of metamorphosis of how I got from that point to a point now where I have purpose, I have joy, I have, I laugh, you know, I have regained, I'm not going to be the same person that I was, but I can, I can have moments of joy and I can laugh when I feel it coming on. And that is, um, I think being a light for somebody else who's maybe not as far along in their grief. Yeah. Well, and, it, and it, I would imagine too, that, that, that being that light for someone else lights you back up as well. Right. 100, 100%. <laughs> yeah. Right? And I buy all of that like healing and like the metamorphosis, like the new, the next level of Susan, you know, on this planet doing this work. I found that in, a pro it was probably about a year and a half after my 
um, after Kevin died, I found by accident that helping other people was a way that I was going to help myself. It was going to be part of my healing process. And that is a big part of the process. It's not all of it, but it's a big part. And it's, it's exciting and it's um, hopeful because we have control over that. I can do things to help somebody else, you know? So that, that is, yeah, it's just, it's a big part of, of the process. So. Now, where are you? I mean, so I feel like when you were working on the book, you kind of sort of had, had it in mind that you might do some speaking and like try to leverage the book in that way. Um, How has that, again, how has that changed for you now that the book is like actually out in the world? Are you like, just like totally doubling down on the speaking thing? Are there other things you now imagine that you want to do with the book now that it's out and you're seeing how these kind of first few months have gone, you know, where, what's like the next, what's the next step? I, I want to continue what I'm doing. Um, I feel like the messages in the book are, again, they're timeless. Um, Overdose is so prevalent right now. It's still very much in the news. It's still, We still have, you know, hundreds of thousands of people affected by it. Um, And like I said, the things that I have in my presentation that we, when I talk about practical and spiritual aspects of healing, that's applicable to any type of grief. So um, I had a woman recently um, come up to me at the end of a presentation I gave and she said, her husband had died the week before. And oh I know, and she, um, and he died from cancer. So it wasn't even the same type of loss, but she felt some of that stigma and that judgment because he was a smoker. And so, you know, you never know how it's going to um, resonate with somebody. So, um, I feel like I want to continue to be doing what I'm doing and it's getting around via word of mouth, um, within the library community. And, um, also I, I have a potential, um, speaking presentation at a school, which is lovely. Um, I've reached out to my dog community, um, and have done a different presentation for them. Um, so it's, yeah, I just I just want to continue what I'm doing. It feels right. I feel very much aligned with the book and the message of the book. Mm-hmm. So I, I want to continue to be a voice for that. Yeah. Um, so I want to I want to just like hang on to that word aligned there for a second. Um, that is like such a powerful part, I think, of crafting your memoir intentionally, like for people who are thinking about doing it and getting on the journey, right? To have a true understanding of what you think you want it to do for you, what you think you want it to do for others, and being open to the evolution of that, right? That it might expand or contract or um, change, but really knowing your own values, your own vision, your own why, right? like, and really leaning into that and not, and not writing something because so-and-so told you that you should, or doing it a certain way because so-and-so told you that it, you know, you should do it that way or, um, getting distracted by, you know, external validations or sponsored ads that tell you, you can do it in 30 days or whatever the hell is out there in the, in the, in the world. Um, (laughs) I know, Susan, that it took you a long time from like blank page to publication, you know, it was nearly a two year um, endeavor, but I mean, would you, because of the alignment and because of how like grounded you are and what you're doing now, would you, would you do it any other way? Would you have rushed the process to get here faster? No, no, definitely not. Um, I agree with you a hundred percent because I, I had this fire in me that I wanted to get this out and I wanted to do it right. That was a big part of um, connecting with you and having you as a coach and just being able to um, make sure I did the story 
in a way that I was going to be proud. Um, yeah. And it's, I get teary, like, you know, when I reread parts of it and um, it's, it was so worth it, but it absolutely needed a fire. Cause it is, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of emotional work. And, um, and it just turned out, it, it, it turned out better than I thought it was going to turn out quite frankly. And I'm just really, uh, really happy that I put the time in and it, it felt really right and aligned and it came at the perfect time. Yeah. Um, so I love, I love in what you just said that the fire piece, like to me, the fire is like the internal flame. It's the intrinsic mm -hmm. motivation and drive to do it. But fire does not necessarily mean speed right? Like that's the thing. Fire means like that you're going to do this thing no matter what, that you're committed to the process and the journey, that you're willing to kind of walk across the coals, even if that, that walk is a long walk and those coals are feeling hot. Um, but it's about doing it methodically and intentionally so that the fire stays burning brightly. And so when you get to the other side of this thing, that book is ready to light the freaking world on fire um which susan i believe your book is i mean the feedback that you're getting from your from your presentations and the communities you're going into and these these individuals who are coming up to you afterwards and sharing their story i mean yeah what a what a what a gift and what a beautiful like cyclical relationship of like you know you gave them this and then they give you something else and then you know you keep perpetuating you know this kind of like conversation outward because you're going to go, you're going to share that person's story with us. We're going to learn something from it. They're going to go show your, share your story and your book with somebody else. And then somebody yeah. else will pick it up. I mean, like this is, this is the ripple effect. And that's how, that's exactly how it's happening. Um, I had somebody recently reach out to me and she said that my book changed her life. That, oh. that is like a very bold statement. And to hear that after, you know, first of all, having lived the story and then having, you know, shared the story, um, it it's in, just indescribable. It's really indescribable the way that feels. Um, and, you know, I want to point out too that when, when we were talking about the fire, I had, you know, I had spent five years going through the process, going through the journey. I had done a lot of the processing of what I, you know, of Kevin's death and all of that. When I say it was the perfect timing, it was like I had done all that and now I had a reason to get it all out. You know, I had, I had this, this job in front of me that was um, going to honor Kevin in a way that was important and would be impactful. And so I just wanted to point out the fact that I had done all of the my grief work and the heavy lifting. And so to be able to write it, I was very much in alignment and it wasn't as traumatic to write it as I thought it was going to be. Yep. Oh my gosh, I'm so glad that you said that because um, one of the things that's really important with, with writing memoir that, that people are intending to publish, right, is that they've had some distance from the actual trauma itself so that they can write more objectively and beautifully about the experience with reflection and meaning and insight and understanding. And when you're in it and you're still dealing with like the immediate you know, right. aftermath of, of the trauma, the loss, whatever it is, you can't do that. You're not ready to create art out of pain. That's right. um, and so, but I also think what's important is to tie this to something that you said earlier, which is that, you know, your healing is never complete. Right. Um, you know, it's ongoing and you are a being on this planet that will exist while still healing. Um, it's, there's no like end point. So, when it comes to like writing your writing your memoir and well, how do you know that the time is right since you're never going to be done healing? <laughs> um, but like, you know that you should do some healing like before you get started. I mean, yeah. what advice might you have? I think that um, 
when I finally, you know, a big part of my story was that I was hiding. I wasn't telling people how Kevin died because I was trying to control uh, how other people would remember him. So that was a huge part of it. Once I had uh, gone through the process of starting to tell family and friends, I think that um, I got to a point where I said, okay, if somebody else feels differently about Kevin, that's on them. That's not on me. You know, I, and I had to be okay with that. They still might, they might think differently of him. So I had to get to that point. So now it's interesting because people will, um, you know, say to me, well, I don't want to say anything that will upset you. Cause that was a part of my, process because I w would get upset when somebody would say so and I tell them now I I can't you you can't trigger me you can't make me feel um uh defensive or anything like that because I have worked through my my stuff so I think that when you can get to that point that's the perfect time to be able to write about it and then be able to talk about it. Um, that that's what I would advise. Yeah. So coming to a place of acceptance and to a place of like kind of owning and honoring your truth. Like this is my truth. This is my experience. Like regardless of what how you interpret that experience or what you could say in response to that experience, it is mine. And how you choose to respond to it is yours. And so it's getting to that place of of feeling that comfortable and grounded right in what you've been through that nobody else no matter what their criticism or feedback could be could ruffle your feathers trigger you cause you doubt like anything like that um that's that's when you've done enough work where you can you can jump on the writing path is that does that sound exactly yes yeah yeah, yeah. so important um all right so susan there's a couple of places, right, where people can connect with you. One, your website. Yes. Um, yeah. And now, Susan, on your website, you have all the information about uh, bringing you in as a speaker, correct? Yes. Yep. I have a media page. Um, I have a contact um, page where you can reach out to me, per, you know, and ask questions. Um, I have a page about my, all about my book, where you can get it. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of information on my website. Yes. Oh my gosh. And and folks, if you want to go and check out pictures that go along with the book, you want to be, you want to be totally scrolling the book yes. page over um, on Susan's website, because it's a lot of fun to see photos that kind of match with um, memories and experiences that are shared in her, in her book, like Dr. Kevin. Yes. And they're, um, all, they're all listed by chapter chapter. So oh, yeah, chapter has a, you know, you can click on it and see all the pictures. And there's also um, in the book, um, I wanted it, one of the things that I wanted it to be that I knew was a um, book club book. So I created 10 questions that are at the back of the book. So you can talk about it in a book club or and that's another way to have me come in. I would love to come in and join you in a book club meeting. I can do it virtually or, you know, depending on where you are, maybe even make it an appearance at your club. So that's um, another way to reach out to me on my website. Um, I love to hear from readers, you know, um, your thoughts of the book, how it, how it impacted you or touched you in some way. Um, all good, all good stuff for connection. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Bring her in for your book club, get life after heaven, just do it. You won't be sorry. Um, and then Susan, the other place people can go and find you, right. Is in your, your, uh, Facebook group life with rune. Yes. Life with rune is my, um, puppy training group. It's a free resource for people, um, training a puppy. I have everything categorized by age. So that's another way I'm pretty active in that group. Um, so you can find me there it's amazing group i don't have a puppy but i already know that when i do have a puppy like that's like the only place i'm gonna live and hang out for at least the first year of puppy's life um and when i see random people with puppies i just go up to them and tell them about life with room. Um, 
for like, I'm okay. So it's a great, it's a great, fabulous resource. And it's just a wonderful place to kind of keep in touch with like what Susan's doing out in the world using um, her book, Life After a Kevin. Um, I think Susan, you're like the perfect example of how one's memoir can serve ourselves as the author and serve um, others out in the world. Um, your book is truly a light, you know that. Uh, I've said that a thousand times before. Um, <laughs> is there anything else that you'd like to share with our viewers before we sign off? Um, yes. So if you are thinking about writing your memoir, hire Allie. She is. <laughs> I did not tell her she needed to say that. She did not. She did not <laughs> tell me to say that. But I am telling you, it will be besides writing your memoir, it'll be the second best decision you ever make. She's incredible and she you know i lived the story i had the story but she helped me craft it in a way that was compelling and impactful that i'm not sure i could have done without her pretty sure i couldn't have done it but <laughs> so hire her she's great love her oh thank you and i love you <laughs> all right folks please go connect with Susan, grab her book, visit her website, join her Facebook group, do all the things. And um, please write into the comments, let us know what takeaways you gathered from this beautiful conversation. Um, Cause we wanna be able to chat with you about how your story can serve you and others. If you're thinking about jumping on to the writing path. Susan, thank you so much for being with me today. Thank you all right. everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>